Thank you very much. So great to be here, and thank you for the fantastic welcome, fantastic organization. Well done. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, the community bridge between heritage and legacy, and I, without being presumptuous, uh, with all due respect, I, I want to start with uh, giving you some definitions so that you understand what I am, what I mean when I use certain terms. So I want to start with the definition of community. Well, with community, I understand a group of people with something in common, and residence is an example of this, but it's not the only thing. Culture, I understand with culture the implicit or explicit knowledge, that is the knowledge that and the knowledge how, okay, ideas and practices and beliefs informing daily and extra daily living. So for me, um, culture is not a sector. So it was very interesting to hear um, uh, Ritis this morning speak about culture. Art, something distinct from culture. It is any discipline, okay, with a particular uh, value, I think there's, there's a mistake there, um, we'll do a value, ignore it please, that can portray, interpret, challenge also, and create culture, all right? So um, art can, can help recreate or challenge culture, that is, the commonly held beliefs, whether they are implicit, that it, whether they are understood openly and consciously or not. Creativity, on the other hand, is our ability to make things new, you know, and it's not something that is only belongs to the arts, of course, but you, you can find it in a science lab, and you can find it in an architecture studio, and you can fi find it everywhere, okay? You can find it with a plumber who's trying to fix your, your tubing at home and needs to find a new solution for a problem that he's perhaps not, never encountered in that way before. And heritage, well, what we inherit Basically, material or immaterial, linking to memory, therefore, we spoke a lot about memory this morning. And legacy is what we leave behind, also material and immaterial. So, my definitions, for me, they're important because in this way, we can separate these concepts. And by separate these concepts, then we are better able to link them, perhaps in a different way. So, I'm going to speak about bridge builders. Okay, because the title was the community bridge between legacy and 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 uh, heritage and legacy, and for me, you know, knowingly or unknowingly, we are all cultural bridges, linking heritage and legacy. So culture is renewed through us. All right, it's memory and vision at the same time. We are culture. Culture is not a sector. Culture is not a commodity, and therefore we can be active bridge builders in this sense, it is, we're involved, or we can be passive bridge builders, we are still bridge builders, it is, we still incorporate and embody this bridge between heritage and legacy, but the question is, are we mindful bridge builders? It is, are we aware of the processes, of the complex processes undergoing when we bring these two things together? Do we know how to look at ourselves in this way? So I think that the European capital of culture can be seen as a fantastic opportunity to engineer cultural bridges between heritage and legacy. And the question, of course, is how this happens. So I'm going to bring a few, um, you know, examples. But so mindful of what? Yeah, mindful bridge builders of what? So mindful of complexity. Um, I, I took an interest as a, as a theatre person. I started taking an interest in neuroscience and science of the brain and in complexity sciences that involve everything from physics to biology and so on. So we noticed that from microscopic to macroscopic levels, everyone and everything is connected. Now this realisation has some important, very important implications. And this important implication is that a small local intervention, okay, however precise it may be, can have very unexpected and widespread consequences. And this was all discussed today, you know, what about insecurity, what about things we do not expect and then happen. So democratic values that we speak about so much, okay, and, and also when speaking about the European dimension, they prompt empowerment to more active and mindful participation. Because no matter what we do, as we said this morning, culture happens. Yes? So being mindful about it, being active about it, becomes an important responsibility. 
So I'm going to show you a few examples from uh, Valletta 2018. I'll take some examples with the opening week leading to, tw the, to the 20th January 2018, which is the official opening. And then I'll also take another, other examples from the community strand. Actually, the, the, the program, Valletta 2018 program, is so full of these examples, it's totally impossible to speak about them all. Just pick a few to speak about different levels also of engagement in terms of communities. So, there were opening fringe activities, okay, it was a week of activities leading to the official opening on 20 January, and as opposed to the big, ev big events in the evening, okay, these were more intimate encounters with the public, which stimulated different degrees of participation among community members. So, you know, um, the, the idea of taking culture, which is not culture, but perhaps the arts, Yes, to, to, to the public. So we have one example here with Lancha Jaya. So we had Kinetic Dance Academy taking dance and music on the ferries. So people crossing the harbour on the ferries, all of a sudden they found a dancer there, you know, redefining the space of, of, of this um, uh, encounter, of this passage. And then we move on to something that was already a little bit more um, participatory with Tallino, okay, which was Osilino, this uh, singer songwriter, multi singer songwriter, who was the human jukebox on route passes already there, you see people um, suggesting, okay, songs to play and singing along, all right, which is something totally different. And then we move on to a different level of, of participation again with Horn Boutique, which was a project I was also entrusted with together with uh, Cynthia De Bono from uh, MOVE. And basically it was about creating a perform performance on people's dreams. So how, how did we go about it? We went in costume, okay, these are the three fantastic actors, Ronald Riffali, Annabelle, and then the Catania, and we're ready to go dream catching. So we went out on the streets, uh, me with, 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 with the recorder, and they in full costume, giving out these postcards that you saw uh, earlier, and asking them to either write or tell us about their dreams, which means their visions, their desires. We went, therefore, into the cities of Valletta, started asking people, they were obviously very happy to see the costumes taking selfies as something interesting, but they started speaking to us about their dreams. All right, so we did this in different uh, times of the year. So at first we went in full uh, early 18th century costume, then we went to the beach, so we, we, we wore something else. It was fun, it was interesting, but it was extremely interesting to listen to people's dreams, what they wish for their life to be better, right? And we recorded all this, and then when we recorded all this, what we did was, I, I took all these dreams and I synthesized them without have, uh, changing the dreams into a performance. A basic plot here is the dreams of Nino, a poor servant, wishing to marry Bella, the spoiled countess who lost her dreams as a child. They conflict with the ambitious, ambitions of Aldo, who's a resourceful merchant seeking to uh, augment his wealth. Of course, what happens is that they have a time machine that you see in the background, and they come to 2018 thinking that they can recuperate Bella's dreams. And therefore, the two guys, by recuperating Bella's dreams, can have the dream realized. So, what we did was, we took the dreams from the residents and from, from the people on the street, and we took the performance back to their spaces. So we took the residents' dreams back to their living spaces, and here they are coming out from uh, the houses or watching the performance from, from, the, uh, from, from the windows or in front of the doors. And it was fantastic to see the engagement of, of the community with this performance. They could really identify with what was happening. They could really identify with the satire we, we, we presented on the aspects of gentrification, for example. You know, someone spoke this morning about, um, you know, when, when you change a city for the better, it's pe people's lives who get better, but whose people's lives get better? Um, this was a very particular place that I've been working on, uh, which is a particular neighborhood with very challenging social uh, problems uh, in the neighborhood. And, and you could see how, how well they could identify with what was going on, because it came from them in the first place. So we move to a different example this time, the Festa Gbira. So the Festa, the Maltese Festa, is a village feast, okay, which defines, uh, it's a defining cultural element in Malta because it fuses sacred and profane customs, and it keeps also artistic traditions alive. And uh, 
we have Valletta's four patron saints, okay, Saint Paul, Saint Dominic, Saint Augustine, and uh, the Madonna of the Carmelo. And we have two band clubs, King's Own and, and La Vallette. And these guys decided they're going to have one big festa all together. Now, normally, there's competition between them. Okay, you have to understand. If you think of Vallette as a very small city, but there are neighborhoods which divide the city, there are cultures associated with the neighborhoods, and there are parish feasts which also help to give this identity of the neighborhoods. Then it's different when it comes to football, because when it comes to football, and they won the Premier League this year, yeah, they all come together. <laughs> all right? But what they did was, okay, we want to celebrate our festas together for the first time. It's a big thing. It's a really big thing for them. Because it's bringing together also the, um, uh, here's what one we say when you don't create culture, you don't take culture to the residents because they're already involved in it, they're already creating it, renewing it and recreating it. And, uh, and FESTA is a fantastic example. I think it's also a very interesting, and we don't have time maybe to go so much into it now, but it's very interesting that FESTA was chosen as the team for, for Valet 2018. And there's a lot going on. And here we, we see them in the preparatory stage, discussing and then putting up all the colorful street decorations. And finally, big night, okay, when they get the deserved recognition for their cultural contribution, contribution for the, the lessons they teach us also. Here we have the four statues in front of parents, an event, big event, gathered crowds of people. But more interestingly, it brought people together who normally are literally in competition. With, with each other, think of how to put this thing all together. Does it mean that you know they, they manage to to all of us and say, okay, no, all the differences are gone? No, on the contrary. But there's a meeting place. And there's a possibility of working together. So now I move on to um, the next project, which I am curating, which is Jewa Barra. Literally, um, uh, uh, translated from Maltese, it means inside, outside. And Jewa Barra is a community arts project conducted by me, of course, <laughs> with Valletta residents, um, all the Valletta residents. The idea of Joa Barra, far from taking culture to these people, is rather empowering creative and responsible participation vis-a-vis -vis ongoing changes in the capital city. So we spoke about change as well this morning, said change is inevitable, isn't it? We said, and it's a big challenge. How to express this change? How to express your feelings vis-a-vis this change? How is it affecting you? Because although the Valletta residents are extremely um, uh, participative, um, sometimes even actively, when it comes to their known cultures, it was carnival, festas, and football, but do these activities actually raise the civic awareness that can help us, that help help them rethink their relationship with what happens in their city as the home. So we're talking about engaging residents' cultures to express the needs and dreams that shape their experience of Valletta as a lived space. So we had to move therefore from uh, formal collective meetings such as this one, where the foundation was telling people during forum sessions, okay, this is what we're doing. And the residents were obviously using these uh, moments to either say bravo or complain about, you know, traffic, no parking spaces, the noise pollution, or the cranes in the streets, so on and so on, to something that was more intimate, okay, to more intimate encounters with members of the community. So this is what I did. Basically, I went to Dewey Valley, which was one of the most challenging neighborhoods, and I just presented myself, starting knocking door to door and visiting house by house, speaking with people. And of course, they were like, what do you want? <laughs> who, you, who are you? Like, you know? Um, but but incredible thing is that when you, when you decide not to go and impose things on people, and you just sit there and say, I'm coming here to listen to you, people start talking and narrating and sharing their experiences. And this is what happened from the very, very small uh, children, okay, to, to the older generations. And this is the, the point of Jawabara to narrate, to celebrate, to play. Uh, there's, there's an tr interesting ludic element in, in the complexity of culture and to care. By means of informal meetings, creative workshops, artistic projects. So thinking about these kids, for example, we did this, this uh, t-shirt painting, uh, very simple t-shirt painting exercise with them. Um, they could practically paint whatever they wanted. But before we held a, a, a little exchange, okay, we exchanged marbles 
for stories from them. And they told us about how they live. They told us about how, how they are, basically some of them are the adults in the family. How they take care of each other. How they do the house chores, how they, how they do at school, what they love doing, what not. So stories start coming out. Then when they painted the t-shirts, the t-shirts, some of them were so excited they, they didn't even uh, allow time for the paint to dry and they put them on. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. So we moved from here and we have to speak to the whole community in, in the neighborhood of Dewey Bali. Uh, so we introduced some experts, architects Maria Ceretta and Fabio Lancio from uh, Naples to discuss the regeneration of community spaces with the residents. So we listened to their ideas and we said, okay, um, um, what would you like to do with this space? And they came up with the ideas, they came up with the ideas for design and what they would want to do with it. So bringing all the stakeholders together, the residents, the foundation, um, the experts, the G G Grand Harbor Generic Corporation, because you can't just intervene in a space in Valletta, which is a you know, World Heritage Site, and do whatever you want. So we needed to plan things carefully. The Valletta Local Council and the architects to change this into this. And this is the, what the residents want, what the residents designed in their minds, all of these things, besides these necessary structural things, uh, works that have to be done obviously in a certain way, they will be constructed, managed, and cared for by the residents. And they are modular to allow them the space to interact better with, uh, with the spaces. So preparing to take carnival down to the neighborhood, there are a lot of part carnival enthusiasts in the neighborhood, but they never celebrated carnival in their own neighborhood. So we organized these activities to celebrate it there. And we went into the houses, a photographer from the neighborhood herself, and listening to stories, presenting these objects, the stories behind these objects. So people open their doors, they tell you, okay, this is the story behind this object, this is who gave it to me, this is the background behind it. And then we engaged a, a writer, Jean-Paul Porsche, to write uh, stories. And we had an exhibition in the open air in their space, and we presented the stories with them, and they could all relate to these stories. And to celebrate and narrate, so we took Carnival down and did this exhibition. And now, towards the Hasla, this fi final thing, the Hasla is um, a performance. It is the, the, the meaning, there's a double meaning to the word Hasla in Maltese. It means both cleansing and telling someone off. Okay, it means both catharsis, therefore, and condemnation or denunciation. And basically, it's going to be a theater performance involving the residents from across the city neighborhoods. And the artist's work will be to facilitate this process. So um, we're also video documenting it. And we had creative workshops, a creative workshop, for example, on fountains and the use of water in the different um, times of the day with Caldon. And they came up with their own ideas of, of what, what, what to do if they had to create a fountain and where to put it in the city and what would its use be. We had uh, more creative workshops on storytelling, for example, with Lien and Lul. Um, and now we're having uh, theater workshops, all right, um, with me and other artists. We're preparing for this performance on the 26th of August. It's going to be a performance ideated by the residents and performed by the residents. To conclude, so what are the challenges to the um, uh, creative civic participation? Because what, what they will be performing through this hustle is, of course, what, what it means for them, what it is that they want to get rid of, and what they feel is, is being getting rid of from the city, including themselves, right? So the process of gentrification, for example, is something very concrete, very much felt. And, of course, I think the, the greatest challenge is change. But we are more inclined, because we are more inclined to preserve the way we are than, than to say, okay, I'm going to change. And to change the culture of civic participation, I think we need to change the culture of decision-making. We need to change the decision-making models, to rethink in the same, different way. When I was doing this project with Dewey Bali, the decision-makers at first said, you're working there, but you know, we, we, we prepare a road for them, and the next day they're again not taking care. I said, listen, involve them and see what happens. Involve them, get, get them to own the project, and then see what happens, what change this makes. But we also need to change the resident's mindset, okay, so we're speaking about culture as mindset, on authority and representation. And I think this is, is a very, very important um, uh, 
thing to think about. Because although we, we think we live in a democratic society, but then we fall into certain structures of representation and, and authority, which, which are very few, if you think about it. Right? Um, uh, so, but, so change has to happen both in a bottom-up and a top-down process. Okay? We have to remember the residents are experienced, but they are not necessarily experts. So we need to bring these two, these two things together. We need to bring expertise and experience together. And there's complexity, meaning we are all connected, and because we are all connected, we are all affected. So building a heritage legacy bridge that is socially healthy requires enhanced democratic processes through mindful civic participation. So through mutual empowerment, okay, and I think the arts can serve process of empowerment, they give communities really the stimuli and awareness necessary to provide decision makers with both insight and support. They can also, living together and adapting to change is complex and will not go away, but I think that European capital of culture is really and truly an opportunity to experiment creative and socially sensitive approaches towards engineering the heritage legacy bridge together. Thank you. Victoria, I'm going to come over. Do we have two questions? Thanks a lot, Victor. Thank it was you. very interesting and inspiring. Uh, I have a question, more than a question, just a thought. Uh, it's, uh, it's about legacy, it's about bridging people, taking people to the... My concern is, I don't know what will happen to Matera, for instance, next year, but my concern is, and maybe you are more expert than me, when all this year will finish, I mean, and if there won't be people who will take the lead on these kind of processes, what will happen? How much a community or how a community can be so much engaged to be self-sufficient uh, to, uh, to move forward? I think that's an ex yeah. extremely interesting and, and relevant question. I think that we're talking, as we said this morning, talking about slow processes, right? We can, can't expect minds to change from, from, you know, from one day to the next. So I think that the experts, without the presumption to tell people what they should think or what they should do, need to be very patient, need to be empowered themselves, to continue this work. Um, it's very difficult to say when, when someone is, um, you know, for, <laughs> I'm, I'm an educator, yes? And as an educator, my work is to render my students autonomous creatives. And, um, and this is, but without the presumption to teach them, I cannot presume to teach them, because I'm, you know, <laughs> I don't, uh, there's this, this, this thing of being unexpected of a live culture. But we need to, to think in terms of a long process. You know, working with the residents in, in, in this neighborhood of Dui Bali, but not only, it takes so much patience. You would go down there to advertise and put on posters and knock up on doors and post leaflets and so on, and 10 minutes before the meeting, you're down there again, knocking on doors and telling people, hey, come, come, in. and what do you do? When do you give up? Or when do you stop doing this? Difficult to say. I, I don't know if I have an answer. I think that then when certain community leaders will emerge, then it will be up to them. I think we need leaders. We can't all be leaders all the time, you know? And understanding how to be a leader, you need to understand how to be a follower. It's, it's, not, it's not just a, you know, a cliche, it's very true. And, and I think we need to be patient. Okay, some more questions? Okay, Victor, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks, thank everyone.